I'm here with Christopher Johansson, who's Professor of Cancer Late Effects Research. Um, we're talking today in this beautiful arena of uh, Lisbon, Portugal, about the importance of psychosocial care in general. And what I want to ask you from the start is quite a tricky question. How do we translate meaningful research into clinical practice, which will then influence patient care positively? I think the major problem is that, uh, as my uh, fellow philosopher Søren Kierkegaard said, people love development, but they will not change. So uh, it is a mindset that we have to change. And yes. I guess that one of the most important things is to change the um, idea that um, uh, clinicians usually only listen to the uh, research which comes out of new uh, pharma uh, pharmacological radiation, uh, uh, other kind of therapy studies. There has to be a new channel open up for listening to all the research done in the psychological and social effects of a cancer disease. Mm. And also of all the trials coming out uh, showing relatively positive results uh, for interventions aimed at improving uh, the coping skills of, of patients and their partners. Mm. You've done a huge amount of research uh, looking at large-scale data. Right. For example, national databases. Right. This is something that I've seen used to great effect in your research. Um, how is it possible to access all this great information? Can other centers yeah. get access to it? Or other is centers it, can is get it access. peculiar to Nordic countries, for example? It's a special feature of the Nordic countries because we have this tradition of having a uh, personal identification number which is assigned to you at your birth. And this number makes it possible to link data from large administrative databases uh, kept for administrative reasons, taxation or whatever, and uh, then link that up to uh, national health and disease registries. We have actually uh, many researchers from abroad US from Europe who uses these databases in collaboration with researchers at my institute. So that's not a problem and we have uh, have great success in actually using the data uh, with, with the foreign, foreign uh, researchers. What do you think are the main uh, positives to come out of this kind of uh, data analysis? The main positive result of these uh, big data analysis is the reliability of the results. We have shown, for example, that what is the prevalence or the incidence of depression. And then you cannot discuss it anymore because <laughs> this is coming from 5.5 million people. And then you know this is, this is a true story. Yes. And that's a very important piece of work to do. It's a little bit of number crutch, uh, you know, crutching and, and, yes. and working, but, but it's still important to do it. Uh, of course, you, you also lack something because you don't know anything about the person. You only have numbers. Is there any way to have a kind of hybrid approach where you have some clinical data but a lot of a lot of epidemiological data and combine the two fields? Yes, that's possible and we do that in studies of we have a study coming out uh, next Monday in the journal of Clinical Oncology where we look at the risk for uh, using antidepressant medication in uh, breast cancer women where we have linked data from about 40,000 women where we have detailed clinical information from this clinical database with a national database of prescriptions. So there we combine clinical and uh, administrative data. But the finest and the most fine-tuned thing to do is then to add on subjective information from the persons and that we have done in a few studies as well. What do you think the most important areas of research still to be done might be for the next few years? There's a big area uh, coming out from the uh, growing population of survivors. We don't know uh, what is the, in the true incidence of late effects. That's simply unknown. We don't know how we could change our treatment paradigm so we could avoid it and then prevent these late effects to occur. We have no knowledge about trajectories. We have no true prospective studies, for example, where we have the cognitive function in women observed years before their cancer diagnosis, then have it on the date of their diagnosis, and then follow up after the treatment, including a number of variables that we think could confound or mediate these associations. Yeah. Such kind of studies are 
greatly needed. Um, then I think we don't know that much about um, which interventions actually help. Mm. And then we have this very ongoing debate about should we screen for distress or should we change the content of the treatment or how do we use this screening approach? Are we actually going to screen or what is the purpose of doing it? And what is that we screen out if we do screen and so on? I mean, it's a long lasting and very difficult discussion. But I think uh, many contributions from, I mean, many scientists have shown that that there are really many gaps in our knowledge. But I think, as I also said during my presentation, that we haven't had a few studies where we combine the psychological, the social, and the medical uh, interventions. Mm -hmm. That we miss as well. Mm -hmm. How much responsibility for improvement, therapy if you like, come, falls outside of the medical domain with volunteers, peer support, web-based programs? Can you see this uh, filling a gap? Or do you think that the medical specialists, including psychologists, can really just expand their portfolio and treat I everything? Think, yeah, I think it's a very good point you bring up because I think that more and more research points to the fact that the use of peers would be of extreme importance. But that also points to how could you educate peers, what would you expect they, they, they would know, and uh, how should they handle the difficult situations of patients that are dying or they themselves, for example, get a re recurrence of the disease and they themselves are dying, how would they then be active, what would be the principles of how you include them. But I think a more targeted and ambitious plan where you think how you could develop a peer program and involve peers in uh, the treatment of cancer patients would be extreme importance. Yeah, the local voice. Um, yeah. Speak up a little bit, yeah. And I'll also ask you that question again. Yeah. But you can say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, to what extent do you think um, medical specialties can expand and expand and treat everything that's needed? Yeah. Or what? Or do we need? the voluntary sector, uh, peer support, and right. things that are not classically medical interventions to help patients. I think you point uh, to a very important area because peer support will be, I think, in the future very important for us as clinicians because we will not be able to treat the number of patients treatable, so to speak. And therefore the idea will be how can we develop and organize uh, but, but peer support is a very big thing because it's been yeah. shown from several studies yeah. how important it is. The problem is mostly that you have no formal protocol for the education or the um, training of mm. these yes, people. That's a very good point. And that is needed. And the other thing is how do you observe uh, the work they do? Yeah. How do you evaluate it? And the third thing is what will be the criteria for excluding peers uh, for the job, yes. meaning that if they get a recurrence or they sure. go into a palliative phase, would you then exclude them or say that's a normal part of life? Exactly. And and all these discussions will be. On that? Yeah, because that's I very think, controversial. Right? Yeah, I think uh, to some extent it depends. I think you know peer uh, peer support is potentially extremely important and will be in the future. I think a major major issue, but we need to find out how do we educate peers what it will be the criteria for function as a peer, when will you exclude peers for doing peer support, mm. uh, which, uh, which uh, examinations or informations would you carry out to find out if the peer could you be usable, should you screen them for this and that and so on. Yes. But these things we have to address because in the future peers will be a part of, of the overall cancer treatment. Yes. Now it's a voluntary, uh, voluntarily, uh, what do you call that, Gen engage people yes. in, in yes. the US is typical, I think also in the UK, yes. but in Scandinavia it's not, it's not a standard, Yes. but yeah. that will come. Mm. Finally, are you satisfied with how far we've come in psychosocial oncology or do you think we've only just kind of started and we've got yeah. a long way to go? Yeah. Mm. In some areas we are pretty far, I mean the documentation of the effect of cancer is quite 
significant. We do know that cancer has an impact on all the aspects of life, psychological, social, uh, economic, uh, somatic, that we know for sure. We don't discuss that anymore. But how do we implement that finding into the everyday, everyday clinical practice? In my mind, we haven't come that far because we are not presenting our science, discussing our results in the fora where the oncologists uh, come. At the large American European meetings, uh, our specialty is placed in a small room in the corner on the last day. I mean, it's, it's like the most important thing in people's life is their emotion, that's um, the emotions, their social life, their relationships, but it's still placed as the last part of the of the conference and I don't get that. Christopher Johansson, thank you for all the work you've done in your field and um, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank, thank you for you. your insights. Thank you. Good.